All right, and we're recording. Hey, good morning, everybody, once again. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for joining. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, good to see you all. I hope you've been doing well. Okay, a few more people joining in. Cool, awesome. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, can I request one of us to just start us off with a word of prayer this morning, please? Anybody, let's go for it. Hey, uh, yeah, John, go for it. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, even as we learn from your word. Lord, your word is power. And we believe in your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, even as we learn, we pray that you will speak to us so clearly and help us to understand you, help us to understand your worthiness, help us to understand the power of your word, God. Help each one of us to align with your word. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, as I... I always like to do before we start our sessions is just to do a quick recap of what we've covered so far. So uh, I mean, it just keeps it keeps the content fresh for all of us, and it, I think it's a good reminder as well. And I'm sure you go back and study the notes that we uh, that we do in every class. But uh, let's do a quick re recap. Right, chapter one is all about uh, giving a definition for praise and worship, or understanding uh, and defining praise and worship. That's what we did. Uh, we looked at multiple quotes from uh, different people about. Uh, their understanding or their revelation of uh, worship. And, um, and we also very briefly understood the definition of praise, uh, the sacrifice of praise, etc. And then we move on to the second chapter where we study the Hebrew words for praise and worship. Uh, we saw, we learned that there are seven main um, Hebrew words for praise. Right? One is called the hands of praise, which is yada. And then the expectation of praise, which is toda, right? Um, and then the third word was halel, which is known as the celebration of praise, which means to make a show, to rave, to rejoice, to celebrate, right? To party, basically. Um, that's what it is all about. Um, so yada, basic, uh, once again, uh, just means... A, Raising him with extended hands. This is idea of uh, you know just throwing up praise at God, right? Um, and we saw multiple verses, uh, multiple scriptures. Uh, two key scriptures that we looked at was Psalm 28, verse one and two, and Psalm 134, uh, right? Uh, an expectation of praise is giving thanks to God for the things that are not yet received. Okay, that's why it's called the expectation of praise. And it still comes from the same root word as yada. Okay. Um, the fourth word, uh, the Hebrew word for praise is shabach, which is the shout of praise. Um, one of the most beautiful things that we learned about this word is that because of our shouts of praise, the next generation will know who the Lord is. And so it is very important um, that the church of our day and age uh, lifts up the shout of praise. Uh, it's not just to get everybody pumped up in a concert or in a praise and worship night. Uh, praise songs are more than that. Praise songs are not meant to just so we can feel good. It's got a nice beat or a groove to it. Um, praise uh, is a weapon of warfare in his kingdom, isn't it? Uh, and there's so much of power and we we learn as we go on the power of praise. But that's Shabbat, um, the shout of praise. Okay. And um, the fifth one is the song of praise, uh, which is Tahila. Okay, uh, which simply means erupting in a spontaneous song, uh, a heart uh, filled with the song of praise for what he, for what he has done and for who he is, basically. That's tahila, and then the sixth Hebrew word is barak, um, which is kneeling down. 
um, before the king of kings uh, to salute, uh, to thank uh, with bowed knees. Okay. Um, and then finally, the last Hebrew word for praise is zamar, uh, which is the music of praise, praising him with singing, praising him with musical instruments. Uh, that is another aspect, another element that's uh, being added in praise. Okay, so seven Hebrew words for praise. And if you notice, all of uh, at the end of all these, each of these sections, uh, I put. Uh, certain questions for you to go back and reflect on and I really hope uh, that you've had the chance and opportunity to do that uh, if you have not done that um, I'm gonna encourage you to do that uh, you know just ask yourself those questions for example in the last section the music of praise in your notes um, in page 12 at the bottom there is a section that says personal or group reflection questions right um, you know, based on these verses, how common do you think the, uh, the practice of music was in the ancient world? Uh, you know, we can use it as group discussions uh, in, in your church, in your church worship teams uh, as well. Okay. Um, what, what role has music played in your spiritual journey? So this, this is just an example of each section. And each section has these questions that you can reflect and meditate on and learn from and learn and even probably teach it to your, to your worship team uh, members if you're part of them, right? Um, so it's very nice. Uh, you know, so make sure, uh, please make use of it. Um, and the other Hebrew word we looked and we learned at was uh, shaha which is the Hebrew word for worship. Uh, it is a posture, the ultimate posture of worship, right? We learned a little bit about posture because if we notice that all the seven Hebrew words for praise and that one Hebrew word for worship, all kind of is an expression, is, is, it, it's, it, it resembles a posture, right? And then we looked at if there's a good posture, there is also a bad posture, right? Uh, physically speaking and uh, realistically, um, if we all know how a bad posture can um, affect our bodies, isn't it? We have to stand a right way. We have to sit a right way. And if we learn to sit the wrong way, uh, you know, over, and if that becomes your practice and a habit, it starts affecting your body, isn't it? Um, I, I don't know how it's in, how it is in the other parts of the world, but uh, you know, in Bangalore at least, um, our auto drivers has have they have an amazing postures uh, when they are riding autos. Right? It's like the handle is here, but the body will be here. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen it, but I'm not sure if it's the same in uh, the past. But then, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the right posture, but hey, that's how they do it. But uh, all of that is for us to understand that. The posture of worship, uh, that word shaha, it means just falling flat on the ground before the king of all kings, face down, putting your face to the dust. Uh, it is a place where you we cannot defend ourselves. Um, it is a place where we experience his goodness, not just his goodness, but his overwhelming goodness. He overwhelms us with his love, with his goodness, with his glory, with simply his presence. Uh, in, in First Chronicles uh, in 15 chapter, we see that the priests could not perform their duties because the cloud descended on the temple. Um, so it is a place where we simply cannot defend ourselves. That is the good posture of worship. And that's what we saw, isn't it? And uh, the bad posture was the posture of pride, isn't it? Now, we looked at a couple of scriptures from Isaiah 7, um, Isaiah 7, I think, and Ezekiel 28. Um, is one of, one of the verses that says, you... About the, about, about the enemy, about Satan. He said, um, I will make myself above the throne of God. I will ascend above the throne. I will be like him. I will be like the most high. Okay, remember those words. I will be like the most high, like God. 
that's a statement of pride and it is the exact same thing that he uses to tempt eve adam and eve isn't it he says if you eat of this fruit you will be like gods um and that is born so humility the origin or the source of humility is god and the origin or the source of pride is the devil you see how serious they are okay pride is devastating pride it will destroy us it will destroy you god you know god can simply not tolerate pride Right? James says uh, he resists the proud, isn't it? But gives grace to the humble. That was one of the scriptures that we saw. But we as worshipers, as worship leaders, whatever, right? One of our duties is to go before him with worship. And the last thing that I want as a worshiper or as a worship leader is God saying, uh -uh, okay, no, Roshan, I don't want you. I, I, I'm resisting because your heart is full of pride. Isn't it? Um, and uh, I was, I'm just reminded of another scripture, but we look at it at another point. Uh, in, it's in the book of Amos, Amos chapter two or five, I'm not sure, but we look at it later. It says, uh, all your praise and all your singing is just like loud noise, gongs. Uh, you don't mean anything. That's God simply resisting their worship. Um, so, I mean, look guys, um, during this course right um we're going to learn a lot of things the practical aspects of praise and worship but there's if, if there's just two things that i would love for you to carry the rest of your life on the subject of praise and worship worship is all about humility and what worship is not is full is worship that is full of pride um so just uh, be aware of that, you know, in your entire journey as a Christian, as a worshiper, as a worship leader. Pride and humility. Good posture, bad posture. Okay, the heart of worship as we sing and coming back to that heart of worship, you need to be humble to say, I'm coming back to you, God. I cannot do this on my own. I trust in you. I'm going to depend on you. The opposite of depend is independence. And that attitude of independence is a sense of pride. You know, I can do this all myself. I don't need your help. Are you, are you following with me? Are you with me? Okay, so all of this is still a recap of what we've done so far and the importance of um, the, uh, the posture of worship and praise. Cool. All right, um, so I hope everybody is with me. Um, Great. Right, today, uh, let's go into chapter three in your notes. Um, chapter three, uh, page 13. Okay. Chapter three, page 13. And we're going deeper and deeper into the subject of praise. Um, this chapter is titled The Foundation of Praise. Okay, found a uh, foundation of praise. Uh, before we build something, before we build a 10 story building or whatever it is, we need to have a foundation, isn't it? Um, and so this chapter is all about that. It's going to set a beautiful foundation. I mean, every chapter so far has been like a foundation, but uh, yeah. Okay, so once again, uh, the definition of praise uh, just to remind us once again is the dictionary says it means to commend to applaud to express approval good job awesome work you know that was really nice uh, admiration of to extol in words or in song to magnify to glorify and praise is the verbal confession of adoration and thanksgiving for what God has done and for what he will do. Right? The, pray, the expression of emotions and heartfelt feelings of thankfulness, etc. Okay? Um, so we praise God two ways. One is directly and indirectly. 
okay just like uh, it is so similar to how we appreciate one another okay it, that's that's how easy it is as simple it is for us to understand um there, there are a couple of people whom i know here so for example it's like i can i can praise uh for example let's say nicholson right i know him i go to say like bro i love the way you play your guitar it's awesome you know i'm applauding him i'm i'm showing my approval my admiration my adoration directly to him right and there's another way of me i can go to john and says like hey john you know nicholson yeah man i i love the way he plays his guitar uh it's just brilliant he's so skillful so virtuous right in the way he plays his guitar i love the way he feel and i know i love his love the way he feels it uh he knows his techniques uh what he's he's amazing you see what happened there right i directly praise him and i can also indirectly appreciate it and praise him through another friend so that's exactly what we do right when we praise god directly we are directly telling him like i am extolling you lord i praise you i magnify you you are awesome you are magnificent you are holy you are amazing you are wonderful you are beautiful you are amazing that's directly praising him and indirectly he simply says like Um let us praise him for he is good don't you know how good he is uh, how wonderful he is right um and uh, i've said this uh, you know i keep saying this like every time there's a word that ends with full right like beautiful or wonderful it simply means he's full of wonder when we say he's wonderful he's full of wonder when we say he is beautiful you are full of beauty when we say that he is faithful it simply means he is full of faith isn't it and that's and that's you know when we come together in corporate worship and we extol we we tell one another is like and when we testify to each other you know i mean it doesn't have to be that you know uh, exuberant all the time even when we meet for a coffee right that's the famous thing in our culture you know when we meet for coffee or um whatever say you know last week i was going through this and god came through uh, he was so good i needed this amount of money to pay for my rent or fees or whatever it is and he provided he's so good he's so awesome and that is it what's happening there you are just showing off his goodness his praise uh, his his wonderful acts indirectly right um so that's what it is um so we praise god directly and we praise him indirectly by commending him to others right so um that's um that's just a brief understanding of how we praise him okay uh, now let's take a look at uh, some of the scripture passage which is essential for our understanding of the foundations of praise okay it, i am i going too fast uh i hope not yeah is everybody okay able to follow yes pastor awesome two people said thank you it's okay we two or three are gathered he is there just kidding uh, all right thank you priya thank you okay um let's let's dive in now okay uh, scriptural references the first old testament reference is found in genesis 25 okay uh, sorry 29 29 verse 35 let's all go to genesis chapter 29 genesis chapter 29 verse 35 and yeah. she conceived again and bear a son and she said now will i praise the lord therefore she called his name judah and left bearing thank you um but but can we just go back uh and read from verse 31 can we do that please from 31 and then we'll come back uh, come down to verse 35 so we understand okay. the context thank you genesis chapter 29 verse 31 and when the lord saw that leah was eaten you was barren and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called 
his name, Ruben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore give me the son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time my husband be joined unto me, because I have born in three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Verse 35. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, right. It's so crucial to understand the previous verses, uh, just to read and go through where Leah is coming from, her situation, her circumstance. Um, so verse 31 says, when the Lord saw, if you have a physical Bible, make sure you underline it, okay? When the Lord saw, Lord saw, he knew, right? He saw and he knew that Leah was not loved. And some translation says that she was hated. Okay. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. Now at this point, or by this point, she wanted to win Jacob's love. That was what dominated um, her focus. She was obsessed about winning Jacob's love for her, which wife wouldn't, isn't it? Right? She she wanted to win her husband's love. That 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 drove her. That was she was determined about that. That was a focus. That was her obsession. Everything. Okay. What is interesting is that, I mean, we know that it's written that the Lord saw. Uh, it's a little sad that Leah did not realize or see that Lord saw. And that's why he blessed her with children. But let's see. Let's, let's go ahead, okay? So she has a first son. And she names she named him. If you, you can underline that as well, okay? She named him Reuben. For she said... It is because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. Okay, Reuben simply means see, see, okay. She names him Reuben because the Lord has seen her. And since she's also telling Jacob, he's like, hey, Jacob, see, I have borne you a son. Will you not love me now? Um, um, no. Didn't work. And what happened again? Verse 33, she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved or because the Lord heard that I'm hated, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she's like, uh, God heard my cry. Uh, Jacob, will you not? Will you not see and hear my cry? Will you not love me still? Because I've been giving you two sons. Uh, why don't you see? Why don't you see? Why don't you hear my heart's cry for your love? And nothing happens. Um, and we go down to verse 34. Again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he named, so he was named Levi. Okay, now there's a footnote there, right? At the end of Levi, I mean, depending on which version you are. But the meaning of the word, the name Levi means attached. It comes from the root word attached, okay? So um, I just... I just paste this in, our, in the chat section. So the third son named Levi simply means attachment. She was now 
hoping that after she gave Jacob three sons, he would get attached to her and love her as he had been attached to Rachel. Okay, and now I'm sure not all of us uh, can relate to what Leia is going through, right? It's not the point, but but it's some way I think we can kind of understand the grief, right? But so she's obsessed. She is she's determined. I want my husband's love. That was her focus. I don't know for how many years, uh, you know, it doesn't record that um, what Leia went through this. And then finally, she realizes, you know what? I've done everything I possibly can. I've been focused on my situation for far too long. I've been focused on my needs for far too long. Um, I can't do it. I don't know. Now, I give, I give, I surrender. I give it all to you. Verse 35 comes into the scene. She conceived again when she gave birth. This time, I will praise the Lord. This time, I'm going to shift my focus. I'm going to praise him. And this is one of the most beautiful things what praise does is it helps us shift our focus from the problems that we face, from the circumstances that we are going through, from the situation that we are in. And it helps us refocus, recalibrate our minds, our thoughts, and fix it on Jesus, on him. And she named him Judah. Isn't that amazing? Uh, that's what, that's what praise does, okay? Uh, but here's the thing. I don't want to stop here. Let's just go a little bit more deeper, okay? Are you with me, guys? Okay. Yeah, let's go a little bit more deeper. Now, what did it do? Now, some translation it says, right, in Genesis 29, 31, is that she, Leah knew that she was hated. Okay? Um, let's go to chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. Okay, verse 18, Genesis chapter 35. I mean, you can, you can read from 16 to 18 or 19, but uh, yeah, I'll just put that for us. Okay. Genesis chapter 35, verse 16 to 18. Then they, then they moved on from that hill where they were still some distance from Ephraim. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid for you have another son. As she breathed her last word, she was dying. She named her son Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. Thank you. Uh, could you read also verse 19, uh, Jafina, please? Yes. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephraim, that is Bethlehem. Okay. Thank you, Jafina. Okay. Now, both the names there in verse 18, Ben Oni again has a, a footnote, and Benjamin has a footnote. Ben Oni, in my Bible, it says, uh, it means the son of my trouble. Uh, Rachel was not happy uh, with what she was going through. She was uh, almost like, uh, you know, with whatever she was going through, she had that. She wanted to complain. It's like, you know, you're the son of my trouble. Negative, uh, you know, something. And then ben Jacob comes into the scene. Um, no, um, Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Okay? That's just for a side note for us to understand. But just look at verse 19. Rachel died, okay, and was buried on the way to Ifrath, that is Bethlehem. Okay? not in Bethlehem, on the way to Bethlehem. That means somewhere while they were traveling, Rachel was buried somewhere in the desert, in the wilderness. Okay, are you guys with me? Okay, good. Now let's go to the um, Genesis 49. Genesis 49. 
Now from chapter 35 to Genesis 49, we see, I mean, the death of Leah is not mentioned. But there's something interesting that happens here. Okay, let's look at, um, let's read from verse 29. Okay, Genesis 49, verse 29. Genesis 49, verse 29 onwards. Genesis 49, verse 29. Then he gave them these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hatchite. Up to... Go on, um, uh, till, um, till verse 31, Jafina. Okay. The cave in the field of Mechafet, near Mamre, in Canaan which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite, along with the field. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried, there Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried, and there I buried Leah. Okay, thank you, Jafina. Right, so, like I said, guys, from Genesis 35 till now, it does not, the Bible doesn't record, uh, or I might have missed, <laughs> if anybody gets to know, uh, if it's recorded somewhere in Genesis, please let me know, but uh, from what I could go through, it did not really record when she passed away, but it records where Leah was buried. Now we need to ask that question. Why is that mentioned? Why do I need to know that? Why is it important for me to know that? Um, you know, what is the importance of knowing where she was buried? We know that in Genesis 35 that Rachel was buried somewhere in the wilderness on the way somewhere, but Leah was given this honor of being buried with her descendants. Now, if there's anything that you and I need to know about the Jews, they take their pedigree very seriously. Like they, they take their, uh, you know, their descendants, their um, genealogies very, very seriously. And by Jacob burying her with Abraham and his wife and Isaac and his wife, he has honored Leah of like the highest honor in their culture at their day and age. Um, so I don't know. It's, I think something shifted when Leah said, I'm not going to be focused on winning my husband's love for me. I'm going to trust and rely on God. And I'm going to praise him and let him honor me the way only God does. And guys, if there's anything that we need to know, the way God honors us is nothing compared to when a man honors us. Right? Uh, it's just such a beautiful thing. Right? Um, and let's look at the following verse, uh, sorry, uh, scripture that is mentioned in your notes. Uh, Psalm 114 verse 2. I'll read Psalm 114, verse 2. It says, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. Okay, are you with me? Judah became God's sanctuary. Okay, now hold on to that thought. Okay, before we go to Psalm 22, I mean, we read this verse last week, Psalm 22, verse 3, that he dwells in the midst of Israel's praises. The Holy One of Israel dwells right in the middle of Israel's praises. Okay, but, but just that verse, it was so strong when I read it. It's that Judah became God's sanctuary. Okay, now let's quickly go to, again, this is not there in your notes, but let's go to Exodus 25. Okay. Exodus 25. Let's quickly go to Exodus 25. Okay, I hope we are all there. Exodus chapter 25. Okay, now this is, in this chapter, uh, is where God is instructing Moses on how to build a sanctuary. Okay, that's the context behind this, the tabernacle. So from verse 1, it says, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me 
from each man whose heart prompts to give, who willingly give, basically. Verse 3, these are the offerings you are to receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod of the breastpiece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. Okay, verse 8, what it says, have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Okay, here God is saying, have them build a physical sanctuary. Use all these gold, use all these, you know, threads and skins and whatnot, all these colors. Build a sanctuary for me. And then I said, once you build that, I will dwell. And then in Psalm 114, we see that the psalmist writing, that Judah became God's sanctuary. It was just, our praise, our verbal declaration becomes the place where he resides, where he lives. Isn't that amazing? And that's what we see in Psalm 22 verse 3, isn't it? It's, it's that he, he lives in the, he's in the midst of the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. Okay. Um, So that's one of the first scriptural references, uh, the first one from Genesis 29 to Psalm 114. Um, and then let's look at the second scripture verse that's mentioned there is from the New Testament, which is found in Matthew 21, 16. Let's all turn to Matthew chapter 21. Okay. Matthew chapter 21, verse 16. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him, yes. Jesus replied, have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? Awesome. Amen. Thank you. Um, verse 16. Right? Uh, let's just read uh, from verse 15. Okay. I'll read it for us. Okay. Matthew 21, verse 15. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 15. Okay. It says, When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, okay, children shabach, okay, shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. I mean, they were intentional. Um, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Uh, he was uh, quoting from Psalm 8, verse 2. From the lips of children, you have ordained praise. You have silenced my enemies. With my praise, you have silenced my enemies. Uh, that Psalm 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 2 and 3 says, isn't it? Um, so, again, we saw what praise did to Leah. It helped her shift her focus, right? Oh, when she, changed, when she intentionally decided to change her focus, we see the way God honored her. And, and we see that praise is something that God has ordained in the lips of infants and children. Okay, and if you've seen infants and children, they don't have an amazing vocabulary. They don't pronounce words very well. Right? And most of the times, we like to imitate them, even if they say things wrong. But God is so beautiful and he says, in their lips, I have ordained praise. 
um, we're going to look at another one of my favorite scriptures from Luke 19, uh, but much later when Jesus says, the rocks will cry out, but we'll go to that in just a second, okay? Um, but look at, look at all these things that's mentioned in the notes, right? Bible gives a list of his attributes. Uh, you know, we praise him for so many various things, isn't it? We praise him, as it says in Psalm 92, verse 1, it is good to praise the Lord and make music to his name, O Most High. A praise is a good thing. It is pleasant. It's valuable, valuable, morally excellent. Everything is right about praise. Everything is right about praise. Psalm 147 says, tells us that praise is beautiful and agreeable. And Psalm 150 says, we praise him for his mighty acts. Ephesians 1, chapter, 12, chapter 1, verse 12 says, Praise Him for God's glorious grace by which we are saved. And 1 Thessalonians 15, 5, 16 to 18 says, This is the will of God that we might praise Him. It is our purpose. In everything, give thanks. It's from the Amplified Version. We praise Him because He is full of glory. We praise Him because He is great. We praise Him because He is wise and wonderful. We praise him because he is merciful and faithful. He is full of mercy. He is full of faith. We praise him because he is the one who saves us. We praise him because he keeps his promises. We praise him because he pardons our sin. We praise him because he gives us our daily food. And like last class I said, there's a book called Thousand Praises. We praise him for a thousand reasons. And like Matt Redmond says, we praise him for 10,000 reasons. Isn't it? But heaven has only one reason to praise him. We have all these reasons. Heaven has only one. And that he is worthy. Okay, that he is worthy. All right, so that's what we're going to be looking at in the next session. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll pause here because uh, I don't want to stop halfway through the topic because it's, it's really exciting. It's really interesting. Okay, so we'll pause here. We'll take a break and uh, see you all again in, at 10 o'clock in 14 minutes. Okay, ciao.